Hey, what's going on guys? Hope everyone's doing well. Video this week, hopefully pretty simple, pretty good. It's gonna be programming words that everyone should know. All right, part one. Don't ever underestimate the power and importance of just communicating well and concisely. And the way you do that is actually choosing your words really carefully. So the right programming words go into the right places and everybody's gonna know what you mean. You'll work more efficiently, everybody will like you more, and you can just describe what you're doing a lot better. Oh yeah, that uh, thing we designed that does that custom behavior during that special scenario, yeah, that thing, right? This video, we're gonna talk about three words, really basic words, operators, modules, data structures. Let's do it. All right, first word we're gonna cover is the concept of operators. You guys have already seen this since first grade, we've been dealing with operators our whole life, but let's just get crystal clear on what operators mean with respect to programming. You can kind of compare operators kind of like functions. They take some kind of input and they produce some kind of output, but they follow a very, very specific syntax and kind of set of semantics, all right? So the most common operator that I think everyone is most familiar with from first graders to advanced programmers is the plus sign or the plus operator. We've all seen this before, especially all over the place in programming, A plus B. That plus sign, those two arrows, that plus sign is called the operator. A and B are called the operands, all right? So we're clear on that first. What exactly is an operand? Well, every single operator operates on something. That something that we're operating on is the operand. Operand. It's a little weird to say, but it's still a thing. The most common use case is when we have two operators involved, and this is called a binary operator. All right, so A plus B, we actually need two operands. We need to add two things. So this is a binary or two operator. Next word that you're gonna hear sometimes is gonna be a unary operator. These are the plus plus or post or pre-increment operators and they operate on one operand so that's why it's called unary operator, all right? Last but not least, these are much more rare but we have ternary operators which operate on three operands. Uh, I think there's only really one of these that's used in practice. It looks like this, I'm sure you've seen it all before. It's really referred to as the ternary operator so You've seen this before, and it's actually the only one that's really used in day-to-day -day stuff. Now, there are a couple other words that we have to talk through that are related to operators that we just have to go over real quick, all right? And those are gonna be infix, prefix, and postfix operators. And these are also really basic words, but they have very special meanings. An infix operator, infix operator is when the operator exists between two operands, like A plus B or A minus B, so infix, when you hear that word, it just means the operator is in between, in between two operands. Prefix is pretty self-explanatory. There's a pre-increment that everyone's used, plus plus A. And finally, postfix operands are when the operand is on the right or after the operand. So A plus plus or B plus plus. Okay, this is the last thing I wanna talk about related to operators. I know I've overkilled this way too much, but this is operator overloading, and it's a really common, common thing across many programming languages, and let's just talk through it real quick. Personally, I've never really been too big of a fan of operator overloading. It's really powerful stuff, but I also think it makes the syntax a little too custom and a little too complicated for my taste, but it's really popular. So most operators in any standard programming language have well-defined meanings, right? If you do a plus plus on an integer, it's gonna increment the integer. But there comes a time when you want these operators to do custom things. And if you want them to do custom things, not the standard stuff, you're gonna wanna do operator overloading. So let's just take a quick example. So let's just say you have a sample class like this. This is not any programming language some pseudo language I made up purely for illustration purposes, so don't get mad at me. It's just gonna be a simple class with two members. It's just gonna be an integer and a string that's associated with that integer. Let's call it a fancy number. So one example of an instance of fancy number could be the number one and the string O-N-E, 
or the number two and T-W-O as a string. All right, so simple class, integer and a string and they both correspond with each other. So we have an instance of our class fancy number. Let's say it's the integer two and it's the string T-W-O and we wanna do plus plus on an instance of that. All right, so what exactly should happen when we plus plus a fancy number? Well, maybe it should increment the integer, right? And then set the string accordingly to whatever we increment to. So if we plus plus fancy number two, we would get fancy number three with string T-H-R-E-E. -E. So operator overloading is really, really powerful, but also really, really dangerous because you could really do anything you really wanted. You can make the plus sign do a minus, or you can make a asterisk sign do a division and just like F up the whole system. So it's a really powerful but delicate thing and it usually leads to crazy complexity. So I kind of stay a little away from operator overloading, but let's just understand what it means. All right guys, so that was just a really quick basic overview of the word operator and some associated lingo with operator. We had infix, postfix, prefix. We also had unary, binary, and ternary operators, all right? So a lot of words floating around, but they all have really, really basic meanings. And if you just hear these words being thrown out, you'll know exactly what they mean. It's not really rocket science, but sometimes the words can be a little confusing, but just use them properly. Okay, done with operators. That took a little longer than I expected, but oh well, doesn't matter. The second word that I thought we should talk about is the word module. This is just the word that I want to bring up because we have to be really careful when using this word because literally there is no formal definition to this word and it means so many different things across so many different contexts. So I just want to talk through it and what it kind of means, all right? But there is no formal definition to the word module. Okay, so I just have this really general three-part definition to the word module. Again, there's no formal definition to this and I'm probably going to offend a lot of people by describing a module like this, but I think it just consists of three basic things. Number one, a module should encapsulate complex code and functionality. Hide it away, encapsulate it away from the user. The second thing that modules should do is always define a well-defined interface for the users. Every time a module is created, it's so someone else can use it or you can use it, but ideally a lot of people can use a module. And in order for that to happen well, it should have a really well-defined interface for the external users. Finally, the third aspect, third and final aspect about what a module really is, is that it should be plug and playable into different parts of the system. Meaning, if I design a module, it should be easily usable by someone else inside the system. So plug and play. I wanna use it here, I wanna use it there, you can use it there, no problem. So again, with modules, no definitive meaning across the board. It might mean specific things for very specific languages, like a module usually means a very specific thing in Python, but that might not be the case for some other language. But in general, right now we're just talking like very general definition of module, and I think those three things were pretty decent to get started. All right, so let's just move on. All right, the last word that I wanna talk about is data structures and actually abstract data types versus data structures. And I just wanna clear the air a little bit about this because I know this could, this caused me a lot of confusion when I was starting to learn programming. So let's just talk through how an abstract data type is different from a data structure. An abstract data type is just a set of rules of how something should behave and operate, all right? And a data structure is the concrete, the concrete implementation of an abstract data type. Let's just make a quick analogy over to hardware land a little bit. Um, if you guys haven't checked out my CPU videos, remember the instruction set architecture or ISA and what that meant? Well. The instruction set architecture was the set of rules and behaviors that a processor had to follow. Now there could be one ISA, there could be one singular instruction set architecture, but many, many different processors implementing that instruction set architecture. So for example, we have x86, which is one ISA, but 
let's think about how many different implementations of there there are. Pentium 1, Pentium 2, Pentium Turbo, Pentium Turbo Plus Plus. All those are implementations of a single ISA. This is the exact same analogy for abstract data type and data structures, all right? If you have an abstract data type, like a stack, it just defines some behavior like push, pop, but actually implementing that, there are many different ways to implement a stack. The two most common ways to implement a stack are probably using an array or a linked list or something much more complicated, but just make sure you differentiate in your head the abstract data type, which is just the stack, just pushing, popping, versus the concrete implementations of how you actually write the thing with a linked list, for example. So that's the major distinction between an abstract data type and a data structure. I know this is a little confusing, like the word data is in both of these words, but in general, and this goes for all of programming, okay? This kind of concept goes for all of programming, but when you hear the word abstract in any type of context, there's no implementation involved. When you hear the word abstract, just think this is an interface or this is a set of rules I have to follow. There's no implementation for something that's abstract. Whenever something is abstract, it can't really exist. There has to be concrete things, like concrete implementers of anything that's abstract, all right? So aside from these two words, when you just hear the word abstract in any type of programming context, those thoughts should go to your head first, all right? So just remember that. All right, guys, that's all I had for today kind of a long video, but we only talked about three major concepts. We just talked about operators in a little more detail than we probably should have. We talked about how modules work or should work. And finally, we talked about the difference between abstract data types and data structures. So three really basic words, three words you're gonna use all over the place for the rest of your engineering life, but three words that we everyone should just understand really well. All right, so. That's all for today. Um, I'll try to think of something else for part two of uh, programming lingo, but I think this is enough for one video. So I'll see everyone next week. All right, take care and have a great week.